Welcome back to the Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast with Benji Nice and Sunday, 9 p.m. Kern of Brussels Kern is on. I mean, oh, might have even started already, Benji. Matthew Van der Poel uh, joining that race. We had Omloop yesterday, busy day for Benji and I. Um, I'm pretty I'm pretty exhausted already. I'm looking forward to this week <laughs> off. Well, it won't be a week off, but a week of not having to watch races too closely before Strade next Saturday and Paris-Nice uh, eight stages, which I thought I'd let you know, uh, given that we're, you know, we're a bit delayed on this UAE Tour one because I, I kind of sooked out and had to go to sleep yesterday. So we'll just do a slower recap today. But I thought I'd let you know about Paris-Nice. I'll obviously have highlights of that. Uh, every day on my main YouTube channel. We'll also obviously be, be producing straight after the stage um, podcast here with Benji and I. And the pods will be up quicker. So as you know, the pods on the podcast players goes up very quick because I literally just get the audio crop, top and tail it, bang it up on the pod player. Then the pod YouTube video goes up a little bit later because I, I try to Try to throw in a few photos and the profiles here now to keep you guys interested, guys and girls interested. Um, and then the YouTube video, then I go to sleep, then I wake up at about <laughs> 10, a, 10 a.m. You're all asleep. Benji probably isn't asleep. He's probably trading cryptocurrency still for a couple of hours at that point. Um, <laughs> and then, oh, maybe I shouldn't tell, the Belgian government's definitely listening to this because they're all cycling fanatics. <laughs> and then... I then yeah have breakfast and then record or start cropping the footage that I download from ASO, the highlights of Paranese. I edit that. I then record, do a pre-cut of the clips, record my commentary, edit that, go for a walk <laughs> for an hour, go for a bike ride for a little bit, have dinner, and then start watching the next stage. So that's, uh, that's why I'm moving to Europe because... I think I'll perish if this continues for much longer. But sorry, that was a lot of uh, about me, Benji. What have you been up to this weekend? You got you got Baby Yoda there. What's what's it actually called? What's the origins of Baby Yoda in the corner? Explain to uh, people. The thing is, I don't want to spoil it because, like, it, it's from oh, the Mandalorian okay. series, and I, I want to give that opportunity right. for people that didn't see it yet because it's a good show <laughs> to check it out and and then they'll know the story. Because I uh, I don't want to spoil it. It's not worth it for people that haven't seen it yet. But yeah, my weekend, it's been uh, pretty busy, eh? Seven hours of watching cycling yesterday and then oh, doing no. the podcast. <laughs> so, uh, whew, like, it, it feels like it's you an didn't easy watch life. Seven hours of watching cycling. Uh, I watched Fornar Dej afterwards. There wasn't a lot of no footage way. from it. Like, I had to look at, <laughs> I had to look at, like, camera footage from the side of the road to see what Godou was doing in that stage. So, uh, it's like Tour de Land yeah. last year. <laughs> remember like <laughs> yes. first time anyone had seen Bernal racing for like six months the Tour de France champion and I was getting footage sent to me for the ITV video from like a young French uh girl who was like a big cycling fan on the side of the road I was like this is the best footage we have to Tour de Land. okay yes yeah, so I haven't watched Four Nardes yet I guess that doesn't make me a proper cycling pundit I guess if that's what you're disappointed call me. Um, yeah <laughs> anyway on to UAE to a stage seven and then wrapping up the GC. Stage seven was a pancake flat sprint once again. It was in Abu Dhabi this time. Stage six was in was in Dubai. Um, and yeah, not too complicated a stage. 147Ks, two intermediate sprints. And you've got to remember with these intermediate sprints, Paulus was fifth on GC, the EF rider, two seconds behind Chris Harper on Yumbo Visma. And they were uh, seconds up for grabs in these intermediate sprints so that was something to watch whether they go for it um but if, unless there were crosswinds which there could be because they were on the coast it was going to come down to a sprint once again sam bennett won stage six he won the other sprint in stage four could you and get it right is ackerman good enough anymore we would see but have you got your notes down? I presume a breakaway went, Benji. I can only remember tuning in when there was some crosswind action, people trying to split it. Yeah, there was a breakaway at the start, but I don't really care. Let's talk about the echelons. <laughs> yeah. So at 62 okay. and a half kilometers to go, <laughs> Ineos triggered a worldwide echelon alert, like literally worldwide in the sense that whenever echelons happen in cycling, we go to Twitter and we see that La Flamme Rouge tweets, echelon <laughs> alert, and everybody's on standby for that. So, uh, yeah, we knew echelons were happening. And 
it actually had an effect. We had a 20-man group forming at the front of Peloton and basically getting away from a bunch of other riders, obviously. That's what an echelon is. <laughs> this explanation is great. Anyway, <laughs> in that group, the most important people, Yates was there, obviously, because Ineos did the echelon triggering. Then uh, Pogacar was still there, so it didn't really work out for Yates and the boys. Gavidia, Ewan, Bennett, those were the sprinters that were up there. Merku as well for Bennett. The thing about this is, Ineos, we spoke about it, I think, two episodes ago or something when it comes to the UAE Tour, that whenever echelons happen in the UAE Tour so far, Gena seemed to have issues with it. And it seemed to yep. be the same thing today, or like yesterday at least. When the echelon happened, Gena was still in the first group of 21 or something. But then suddenly, he started having trouble at the back of the group. to prove it. Was he not the guy who instigated the, the initial echelon or was is that an excuse or do you think he's actually not that good in crosswinds i don't know like still instigating the crosswinds you do that with multiple people and it's not like you have that one rider who masterfully smashes it for a kilometer and then it's totally done Gena won't be done after a kilometer of smashing it at the front of the peloton so he seems to be in a difficult situation once he gets to the back of the group to get back into the group perhaps because he's larger than some other riders that that comes into play, that he's more obstructed by the wind than other people. But yeah, it, it seems like he's having difficulties or that echelons or a tiny bit of a weakness for him, or it's just coincidental that just these three times he's been he's been having a bad day in the echelons. But uh he was unable to stay in that first echelon and was dropping but from that. You. But yeah. People told me that he's an ex Fabian Cancellara. Yeah. I uh, don't know what to say about that. I'd like to see him win the Roubaix first. Yeah, I think uh, Gana, Gana, obviously, like his TT is insane. It's probably, you know, best level yeah. we've seen for who knows how long. And the difference between him and the others, particularly in the shorter flat TTs, is it's not even close. But I think in terms of road racing and the classics, I think he's more Tony Martin than a Fabian Cancellara until I see something different. Um, particularly uh, the crosswinds, Adam Yates is better than him in crosswinds. So Adam Yates literally was at the front, not even in the front yeah. group. He was like in the front three riders rolling every time, every echelon, even when there were multiple times in the stage, like in stage seven, and you'll see it in my highlight video, Adam Yates is there in both echelons at the front. Luke Rowe, obviously God in crosswind as well yeah. and i think ghana yeah tony martin was never a dominant one one day racer now ghana has won paris bay under 23 so i'm not saying i think he's still, still gonna be pr pretty good at paris bay but i'm, I'm just saying let's cool the jets on him riding away from everybody at paris bay i think i think it's getting a little bit out of hand just like you know seb Kuss is gonna win giro d'italia because he led Primoz Roglic out on some mountains in the Tour de France. I think racing is a little bit more complicated than that. It's not just a simple equation like some people try to make it. Uh, although people accuse me of just making things a waltz per kilo. Anyway, it came down to a sprint. It all came back together. And I think the main point of this sprint that I want to talk about is and where I've disagreed with people because I was disagreeing. I was talking to people about this sprint, and they said, "Oh, well, Lotto changed it. So Lotto changed the order around of Jasper de Boist and Roger Kluger on stage six. Kluger, I think, went to the front at two k as the second last man. De Boist, last man for Ewan, and they they came to the front too early today. They've done what they have done previously, Lotto Sadar, when they've been successful, and they just brought kept Ewan safe, and then brought him to the front at about five hundred meters." without having had to do any work before then from 2Ks to 500, and then he does it himself from 500 to 400, sliding on two wheels that he needs to get onto. I think, and then he basically, I'll just go through the sprint, Benji, because we're already up to that point. <laughs> then <laughs> Ackerman's nowhere. Martin Lass is, is leading it out. Ackerman's nowhere on his wheel. Sam Bennett gets brought up on the right-hand side to flat sprint into the Abu Dhabi breakwater area. Then it gets brought up on the right-hand side by Merku. It looks like it's going to be stage six all over again, but then Ewan slides onto Bennett's wheel as they move up. Bennett starts sprinting at 175. 
and then Ewan comes around him on a slight left-hand curving finish. And you mentioned it to me yesterday, Benji. What did it say to you when Ewan hopped off Kluger's wheel at 400 metres? What does that tell you when he left his lead-out man's wheel to go follow, uh, I think, Martin Lass's line on the train? I feel like he didn't even bother too much to follow Kluge to begin with. Like the second that Mirko and Bennett passed them on the right, he decided to follow them after being in the wheel of Lars. But before that, like you mentioned, he chose to get into Lars's wheel over Kluge. And that displays to me that he doesn't fully trust the capabilities of Kluge to keep himself up there. And it's something that we've seen quite a few times with Ewan where he decides to choose his own path instead of following his team sometimes. And in some days that really works out and in some days that doesn't work out. Now, for me, that seems like he just doesn't trust Kluge that much, which I don't know if but he was right. True. He was right, yeah. right. I think, he if, I think right. if he followed... So, so there's... The road is slightly bending left. And I'll, have, I'll put up another screenshot as well if you're watching the YouTube video, but slightly bending left. Last left on the left-hand side, as the riders are looking at it, Kluge in the middle, Mirku on the right-hand side. Because it's slightly bending left, they all want to get to the middle on there's a middle center line with their lead-out man. Kluge has a space to get there if he's strong enough, but he didn't. Mirku came across from his right and pinched him. Last moved up from the left and took came into this space. I think if Ewan had sat on Kluger's wheel, who wasn't good enough to punch through the middle, I think it would have been like the other stages yeah. where he would have been 10 wheels deep and it, he would have been like Ackerman. Ackerman had, was sat back there and he would have been nowhere. So I think he was right not to follow Kluger and it's just that yes. shows the difference between Kluger and Merku, right? So you think if Merku would be able to punch that gap through the middle, right? Yeah. He's probably finding a way, or at least he would have guided the sprinter that he was with into a position where he's not going to have trouble with that issue. And here, like, let's take it a bit earlier even, because it's opposite day. We're going to try and do everything in an opposite order here. But just before Ewan, I want to talk about Mirko and Bennett, because this is also an example of a different style of lead out towards Kluge and Ewan. Before the sprint, I think with 600 meters to go, we saw that Bennett was in the wheel of Merku. 500 meters to go, they were both on either side of the road. Something happened that Bennett was on the left side of the road and Merku was on the right side of the road. And that's an issue if you want to try and follow your lead out if he's on the other side of the road boxed in. And somehow, Bennett tried to find a way and go the other way around, around the other sprinters to get to Merku by the time they get to the last 300 meters. And they found each other again. Bennett completely trusts Merku there. That's what I'm trying to show you. Bennett is not trying to find a gap himself. He's trying to find Merku with 500 meters to go, which is what the other sprinters will not be doing. The other sprinters will be like, oh my God, he's on the other side of the road. Panic, I need to do everything myself now. Let's try and follow this sprinter or that sprinter. No, Bennett decides, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to trust the plan that we have. I'm going to try and figure out how to get to Merku's wheel. And then we're going to find a way to get to the front. He gets to Merku's wheel. And what does Merku do? He sees that. He brings Bennett to the front. That is the example I'm trying to show you. Because that's a clear difference in trust. Ewan, whenever something happens that he's on the other side of the road, he does not have the direct instinct of, oh, I trust Kluge so much that I'm going to go to the other side of the road. And I'm going to try and find Kluge again. Because he's the person that can bring me forward. Bennett has that. And... That's why I think that the bennett Merku duo are just so ideal. And this brings me to the final sprint then, because, again, opposite day. <laughs> We've got the sprint where Caleb Ewan is in the wheel of Bennett. And this is what I meant a few days ago when I said the difference between Bennett and Ewan is Merku. If Ewan is in a great position in the last 150 meters, he's likely going to win the sprint. Why? Because I believe that Ewan has a tiny bit more acceleration power than Bennett does, while their top speed is relatively the same. And as a consequence, if Merku brings Bennett to the front in the last 200 meters and Bennett goes with 175 to go, and Ewan has the wheel of Bennett, he's got the upper hand because 
he's got that acceleration to boost Boss Bennett in the last 100 meters. And he is in that position because, well, Merku basically brought Ewan, kind of, in some kind of way, to the perfect position as well, in the wheel of Bennett then. So that's the point I'm trying to make. I think that Merku is the key to not necessarily handing wins to Bennett for sure. That's not what I'm trying to say here. I mean that he's the key to bringing the sprinter that is in his wheel consistently to a good position. And that position is why Bennett is the most consistent sprinter throughout the year. Because he is in that perfect position by Merku every single time. And that's the small margin that Bennett's need to be more that Bennett needs to be more consistent than any other sprinter out there. While Ewan doesn't have that, and therefore he can't achieve as many victories as Bennett does. And Ewan, to win yesterday, he got super lucky. He has no wheel to sit on, and then suddenly Merku charging up his right-hand side with Sam Bennett there, and Bennett's wheel magically appears right in front of his front wheel, and also no one's following Bennett strongly. Case Bowl let the wheel go because he wasn't strong enough, and there's space on the right-hand side of the road for Ewan to actually kick into. If any of those things don't happen, if Bennett and Merku maybe are on the other side of the road, if Case Bowl or Ackerman are fighting for that wheel and Ewan gets pinched like Decker and Viviani pinched him on stage six, or if they're on the barrier side and Merku and Bennett like they did on stage six, where Merku made sure he left just one rider width to the right-hand side and Bennett sprinted into that, if any of those things had happened, Ewan doesn't win either. Whereas Bennett, he still nearly won. And as Benji said, it, it all played out perfectly for Ewan. He didn't have to do as much work from 2Ks to 500 metres. And he's just more aerodynamic at the sort of top. I think he can hold the top speed for longer than Bennett because he's more aerodynamic when they're both in the wind fully sprinting. And we saw that, I think, yesterday. And he didn't beat Bennett by that much. And that's, the diff that's why I think these two are clearly the best sprinters in the world because Case Bowl had that opportunity to get onto Bennett's wheel and Bennett just, when he kicked, gapped him and he wasn't yep. even contesting the finish. Same with Bauhaus and, and Greipel, obviously. So it's, I think it's clearly these two, but the reason Bennett will win more is because He's just got – I think he's, he's bigger as well, so just that helps and he's just got a better chemistry with with uh, with Merku and, yeah, but yeah, that's why he won two. Ewan, Ewan then won one. I think he beat Bennett by half, maybe a wheel or so. It kind of reminiscent of the Tour de France stage last year where he beat Bennett. But here's the full results. Ewan first, Bennett second, Bauhaus third, Merku still fourth. He still beat Case Bowl fifth. <laughs> Greipel sixth, Vendrame seventh, Meshkets eighth, Ricardo Minali ninth, Gidic for Astana tenth. Ackerman Benji, let's talk about him quickly. I I had a pretty, I think I bet 500 bucks yesterday that Gavidio would not win the stage. Um, but it was at long odds, so I didn't actually win that much money. That was my liability. But Gaviria 12th. What's going on with those two, particularly Ackerman? Uh, I mean, Gavidia, COVID and, and all that, he barely had any lead out. But Ackerman, Benji, are you concerned that he's just not, he's having issues or is the excuse that Selig, Selig is not here and that's the problem? I think their issues here seem to be their positioning a bit. I know that when Gavidia was at the Koenig quick step, he had a perfect lead out there and he had that in the form of both Merku and Richese in the same train sometimes. But I think since he joined UAE, he hasn't found that perfect combo. He kind of had that with Milano at the start of 2020 in those early season races. But obviously he had COVID and so forth. Milano towards the end of the season wasn't that strong as he was in the preseason pre-COVID. So I think there's a bit of an issue there. And those were also races that that combo was good at where the competition was not there with the best sprint trains. And... Right here, UAE, you've got most of the best sprinters in the world all together, except for like Demar and such. So in general, this is where the teams are sending their sprint trains to and so forth. You're getting into a situation where you can't have five sprint trains by the side of each other on the same road. It just doesn't work like that. Perhaps in UAE, it's kind of possible. But towards the end, these roads also narrow a tiny bit going into the cities. So is isn't fully possible. And as a consequence... 
the lead outs of each of these riders, Akeman and Gaviria, well, they don't have the ideal way of bringing their leader to the front either because I think the only person that's able to do so in such a sprint seems to be that Merku rider that we keep talking about. Richese in the was very strong a few years ago, but he seems to be falling off a tiny bit the last two years. And this year, I really haven't seen too much from Richese that I'm like, oh my God, this is the Richese that we saw two years ago. And I think that's also one of the reasons. Last being a lead out doesn't really seem like a bad thing necessarily for Ackermann, but he just doesn't follow his wheel most of the sprints, which means that I'm not sure what that means. Lars is in a proper position. I think the actual issue with Ackermann is the first sprint we spoke about, it was because they launched too early from the wheel of Lars. Lars basically kind of left him too early as well in that same combination. So Ackermann going too early and Lars having him dropped off too early. And I think Ackermann is now thinking, I shouldn't follow Lars because he went too early that day. It seems to be going pretty early again today. I need to try and follow uh, someone else in the sprint, perhaps a sprinter that is trying to follow Lars here. And I think it just didn't work out because he got boxed in and couldn't get past people anymore. But I also don't think that Ackermann is on the level of Bennett and Ewan right now. And I think those are plenty of two is best better than in the world as we speak. Yeah, for is sure. Really? Is he a better bunch yeah. sprinter than Sagan? I believe he's a better bunch sprinter than Sagan. Sagan in the Tour de France last year. Fifth, fifth, fourth, yeah. third, fourth, third on Champs-Élysées. Giro, second, 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 second behind Neymar. And there was that stage he got relegated as well where he was in the top the five. The difference there I'm for me saying, is that... I'm just saying he's very consistent in the sprints. Yeah, you're right. But I think that looking at Sagan's Tour de France last year, for example. Giro as well. Giro, he was closer, but the competition was much more soft there. Viviani and Gavria were nowhere to be seen there in those sprints. And Tour de France, he was consistent, but the difference there is that I believe that if Akamon is in a sprint in a ground tour, he has the capabilities of winning a sprint if it comes down to it, if the situation is all right. Sagan, the last two years, I don't have that feeling that if the best sprinters are in the sprint, that he's got the possibility of winning. And that's where the difference lies for me. I think that Akamon can win a Tour de France stage in the sprint. And Sagan these days seem to have a much harder issue with that. While he's very consistent in getting third, fourth, and fifth, that's not the same as winning. Yeah, I think I think that's right. I think Ackerman has that pure top-end power where he can win the sprint, as you say. And the reason for that is Sagan doesn't have that but you're like, oh, well, how is he always up there? And that's because he follows the wheels really in a smart way. So he's following the wheels, getting the draft, and it's kind of like Decker. When Decker was following Bennett, he's coming through really quickly, beating everyone else, coming second. But to actually come off the wheel and sprint and win and be quickest, you need massive power and timing. Decker didn't have it against Bennett and Ackerman can have it if he has the power, doesn't have the timing at the moment. And Sagan, I think, as you said, doesn't have that uh, timing. But still, you know, he came fourth in Milano Torino. But that, again, as you yep. say, that's behind DeMar, behind you and behind Van Aert. Um, it depends what you want, I guess. You've got consistency versus someone who, if, they, if it all comes together, they can win Grand Tour stages and multiple sprint stages in, in the same Grand Tour. Uh, but other results for the UAE Tour, obviously, is the overall classification. Tata Pogaccia wins 35 seconds ahead of Adam Yates, a minute and two ahead of Almeida, and a minute and 42 in fourth, Chris Harper, who is three seconds ahead of Nilsson Paulus. Paulus didn't manage to get any intermediate sprint points against Harper. Harper was very active trying to get into echelons. I thought that was really good to see uh, in the last couple of stages, particularly the last stage, I think. He looks like a really solid rider, Chris Harper. Um, and we thought Sepp Koos was going to be their GC man for the UA Tour. And I don't want to hear anything about free Sepp Koos. I had that last year for certain stages, going for stage wins, etc. But he was he was free at the UA Tour and he didn't perform. So Vingegaard got the stage and Koos made a lot of tact- or made some bad tactical mistakes. 
when he could go for the stage in stage five. And then his TT is terrible. And then he missed the, the cross win split in stage one. Harper made that split. And Harper was their GC man. So, yeah, I got to say, it's not been a great UAE tour for Sepp Kuss, Benji. Does this, but does this change anything that you think about Kuss and GC, or is it just confirming what you already suspected? Uh, it doesn't necessarily confirm or deny anything. I think that the thought I had about Kuss is that whenever he arrives at a Grand Tour that has more than X amount of time travel kilometers, he's already off the card. So, yeah, that leaves only the Vuelta to really do anything because the Vuelta usually has the least of time travel capabilities necessary to win that grand tour and i still believe that he can do well there but he needs to find consistency and i i think that consistency is kind of what he's lacking at the moment and not necessarily not necessarily the the tactical stuff and so forth i think that will come oh really as more races he does no don't you think so i think the i think the race craft's a problem just the, yeah. the way he yeah like his attack Anytime I've seen him attack when he's genuinely going for it, it's not at a it's not at a great time. It's often off the front. His attack on stage four on her feet, stage four, three on her feet. Sorry, Bookman flicked him through to pull, and he just attacked. And Yates and Pagacha, we th- I on the pod was like, why is Yates following his his move or closing him down? But Yates was literally on his wheel, so why not follow it? And um, he just yeah. Whereas Vingegaard. That- Wingergaard waited late into stage five. Yeah, but waited for a few attacks and then attacked. I disagree on the stage five thing because that was a situation where Wingergaard attacked on the left side of the road and Kuz on the right side of the road, and Kuz was like, "Okay, you can go," because they can't attack. I don't think Kuz was attacking. Kuz was following no. Yates. Oh, okay. I think he was following Yates, and but Wingergaard seeing Kuz's his seeing his movement kind of stalled him. Because he thought, oh, what, oh, what's he doing? And he thought he might have been attacking. But when I watched it again, I was like, oh, he was just following the wheel of the eights. Now, maybe he would have then attacked over the top of him. Um, but, yeah, maybe you're right. L- listen, if, if Vingegaard wasn't there, Kuz could have attacked and likely gone for the stage win too. But I think the race craft as well. Now, listen, a lot of GC contenders missed that split on stage one. But he didn't. Yates did. Yates is a small guy. And Kuz isn't that young, so it's not like there's this, oh, well, whatever, he's missing crosswind splits, but he's 20 years old. Um, he's 26, so the learning curve needs to be pretty rapid. In a, to, you know, winning a Grand Tour or even getting a podium on a Grand Tour, it's not just about, oh, well, are you the best climber on Col de la Lose or Anglerou. The gaps he'd need to make if you're making mistakes in crosswinds, in medium mountain stages – in even flat sprint stages if you're not in the right position, which Ineos kept Yates in good position, or and then the TT, it's, it's more than just the climbing. So, yeah, it wasn't, um, wasn't the best, I think, showing, showing from Coos, but it's not a disaster either. It's, uh, it, we'll see how it goes at Catalonia and Romandy and Dauphiné as well. I think he's supposed to get leadership at Catalonia. So that, that's a race that does definitely suit him more as well than the yeah. UAE Tour uh, too. So let's uh, let's wait and see how it goes there. Otherwise, uh, Matthias Skelmose Jensen, sixth. No, <laughs> didn't know, honestly, I didn't know who the guy was. Uh, and sixth is, is really, really good. Um, I forgot to mention, Benji, that Yates crash. We didn't mention it. There was a random crash where Brandon Rivera clipped the wheel of Luke Rowe 40Ks from the finish and Yates – Rivera then took down Yates. Yeah, he smashed his face into the tarmac. No one else pretty much crashed badly. What poles luckily escaped hurting himself. He was near them too. Have you heard anything about this from Yates? I know he finished the stage, but he looked pretty banged up, and I wouldn't be surprised if he chipped some teeth. Yeah, I haven't heard anything from it, to be honest. I, uh, I also haven't really checked the Ineos, uh Twitter because uh, there was too much cycling to watch the last couple of days. Um, but I did like <laughs> notice, obviously, that afterwards the entire peloton was waiting on Yates. Um, I find that a good thing. Not necessarily in the situation because it should be done because Yates is high up in GC, but because of the fact that it's just a good choice by Pogacar to do it. He knows that if he doesn't, if he uses this, then he's obviously going to be seen on Twitter by a bunch of people like, oh my God, that's the guy that decided to pace once Yates was on the floor, blah, blah, blah. 
And the same for the riders behind you. It's like... Or be Almeida uh, and Harper and Paulus. Because Pagacha's yeah. already head on GC. Yeah. Uh, I don't think they, they would do it because then they would... Yeah, I feel like social media has changed that a lot. In the past, yeah, you'd agree. never have criticism from, from that. And now you've Nor got should you, in my view. everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> now, now in the, real, in the world that we know what would have happened in terms of Twitter blowing up, etc., people getting mad about it, and it's the UAE tour, you definitely don't pace. You, you wait for Yates and everyone shut it down and stop racing until like the last seven Ks, which I thought was a bit much. Um, <laughs> like everyone pretty much like, oh, I think people are like, oh, fuck this. Let's just get on the plane safely. You know, we're nearly there. Yeah. Um, personally, if it's a more in, important race or a grand tour, if your domestique through no fault of any other rider is inattentive and bring down, brings down your GC leader, why is that Joao Almeida's fault? It's not. Um, quick step, maybe he got better domestiques because they don't randomly lose pay, you know, lose their attention and click their wheel and bring down bring down Yates. Now maybe I'm being a a bit mean. I'm sure there's a lot of people. A lot of people disagree with me on the Movistar Vuelta Roglic crash thing, but I agree with you there. Yeah, I think it's a very, very fine line. I think there's a clear answer, as Benji said here, in the context of the UAE Tour where GC's already been sewn up and Benji straight up, like obviously it's a pure sprint stage. But if they were getting into position before the run into a climb, a final climb or uh, even some rolling hills, sorry, the, you know, GC <laughs> movements can be made there. Well, that's my view. I mean, yeah, and that's just. I agree. Uh, uh, but I'm sure people will disagree, or some will say, "Let's stop with these unwritten rules." But fabulous performance from Tata Pagacha. I think the clear one is his flat ITT. He cemented that he's a great ITT rider. Flat, rolling, mountainous doesn't matter. Yates as well. Very, very solid in the mountains. Now, I don't know what Yates has next on his program. Cadillo, Vuelta leadership. I think Yates could win the Vuelta, Benji. I think he'll be a top favorite for the Vuelta. And I, love, yep. I can't wait to see him against Pagacha. I think I think he can drop Pagacha on things like Angleru or the steep stuff in the Vuelta. Um, I don't believe it. You know? It's three weeks, okay. and like he had one good, good Grand Tour. That's the one he got top five in the Tour, I think, a few years ago. But since then, every single time he goes to a Grand Tour, he falls off in the last two weeks so much that it's oh no 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 noticeable for. Don't get like, me wrong. Okay. No no he'll he'll I'm saying he's going to put twenty seconds into Bagatcha on one of the climbs, but then lose yeah. like four minutes on a medium mountain stage where he for no reason. <laughs> I'm not saying he's going to beat Pagacha on GC. I'm just saying he could drop him one day, but then there'll be a random oh, time okay. in the three weeks. He'll lose hella time on not even a hard stage. Okay, I was confused. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. No one clipped that saying that I thought Yates was going to beat Pagacha on GC. I'd never say that's heresy. <laughs> <laughs> my takes my takes are hot and Anna van der Breggen not winning many races uh, I'm trying to calm down at the moment because that's not looking like my best take after yesterday. Uh, but any other like prints, uh, thoughts or things from the UAE tour, some takeaways, Benji, that stood out for you? Um, but yeah. Uh, I don't know. I feel like I've got a much more clear view on how you and Embedded relate to each other and how good they are in certain tactics and in certain ways and in certain sprinting abilities. And I like that. That's what I was looking for in this UAE tour. We said in the preview, I watched the UAE tour to figure out who is the better sprinter and in what kind of way they are good. And I feel like right now we know that Ewan and Bennett are both the best sprinters in the world and that Bennett gets more consistency because he has Merkel leading him out while Ewan can try and get the upper hand in his acceleration in the sprint while their top speed is relatively similar. So, yeah, I think we've got a good, clear view on on those two riders, and I hope to see more of them battling each other out on all the stages because it's been very interesting, these sprints. Like, a lot of people say that these UAE Tour sprints stages are hella boring throughout. Yeah, they are, but 
I don't care about. The I don't first know. No, there were echelons in a lot of them. Like there were echelon attempts in a fair few of them. I think. Yeah, were, I think it was a pretty good. I think it was a pretty good race, actually. Like, yeah, I really three, enjoyed it more than three, all. <laughs> three sprints, one flat ITT, two mountain stages, one steep, one longer, and then a, a mad crosswind stage. It's a, for a one week race. That's a lot of good racing. So. You yep. got to say it. U A E two was really really good, and I enjoyed watching it a lot. And yeah, our video, my videos on it, and the the podcast did really well. And Omloop, people haven't seen that interested in it, um, and the way it panned out, and it was missing a lot of big names. You got the Tour de France champion at the U A E tour, and for better or worse, I know the world champ was at Omloop, but uh, yeah, I think U A E tour is gonna. Keep attracting big names. And I think uh, Brian Smith said this on the commentary as well. I don't think people are there for just like to have a laugh anymore. I think people genuinely are, actually care about winning those races now and it's important to them. World Tour points, World Tour stages are important. Um, so I think we'll see an equally strong field next year. But that's been our wrap up of the UAE Tour. Let us know down in the comments or via Twitter whether you enjoyed it, what your favorite stage was, any takeaways from it. And, uh, I guess we'll see you next at, at Paris Nice, Benji. Is that next or Strada? Bianca, right? Stra- yeah, Strada Bianca next Saturday. Wild Van to win by three minutes. All right, see you, everyone. Ciao. <laughs>